no greater way than to start our service out with prayer. Amen. Let's stand together and, and, and sing praises to the Lord this morning. Let's ask now as we come to worship Him in the Spirit truth. Now truly is the time to worship. Let's sing this together. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day in which you provide us, Lord. We thank you for all the many blessings of life that you provide, Lord. Every 
All the times we get down and get discouraged, we just stop and think and count our blessings, Lord. We find out how much you've really given us, Lord. Yes. Now we ask that you would bless this offering. Use it to your benefit to, of your kingdom, to raise your kingdom here on earth, Father God. And just like young Cameron got saved, Father, use this money to save souls and, and, and to win the lost, Father. Which in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen.
came in to sing for the early service, my heart was in a real bad place. I was depressed. I was discouraged. And I didn't really feel like singing. But God and His Holy Spirit came along. And He told me that this was where I needed to be. And the sermon that you're going to hear was for me this morning. And He lifted my heart. And I just want to know that we can come here and worship Him. And I'm so thankful for that. Amen. And I thank God for all that He's done in my life. Most of all, for saving me. Amen. You know, sometimes when, as Vera said, when you come in and you, you have that depressed feeling, feeling like the world is all against you, you've got to remember that the Lord is there always. Amen. Uh, we were singing a song in the early service this morning, and, and as we were singing the, 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 the song, I was reminded of this scripture, and part of the song comes from the scripture. It's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. That's one of my favorite scriptures. We are a chosen generation. Amen. We are a special people. And we are not special because of ourselves. We're special about, uh, because of the God we serve. That's the right. God we know. The God that we worship this morning. We are a chosen generation. As we sung that last part of song, Be Ye Holy. You know, sometimes we feel like it's not the right appropriate time to worship God. We feel like that I'm just not in the mood to worship God. But guys, let me tell you right now, remember this. Worship is not about just the good times. That's right. But worship brings you through the bad times. Connecting your heart with the Savior's heart is the, what I would say, the medicine to everything. The cure for everything. Because... Guys, we're not just singing to an idol that's sitting, sitting on, a, on a dresser somewhere. We're not singing to, to some man-made idol. We're singing, the, singing to the God and connecting with the God that created me and you this morning. And so many times, and I, so many times as a church, as a, and I'm talking about the church in America, we focus so much on, on ourselves and we forget about who we're worshiping. We worry about what song we like, what preferences we like, what we like, you know, just for ourselves. Amen. We forget that every song that is wrote for Him, that comes from His Scripture, is worship. Amen. And today I ask you, and I challenge you today, as we worship Him, forget everything around you. Connect your heart to His this morning. Because, guys, as a community, if we're going to reach out to these people. We need to connect to God first because we cannot right. do it without Him. That's right. Amen. That's right. We try to do it. Well, we can't. There's no possible way because He is God and we are not. So as we sing, let's glorify Him this morning. Let's just sing this simple chorus and remember that He is the Trinity. He is the Holy One. And let's lift it up this morning to Him.
Amen. Let's give our Lord a hand this morning. Amen. Amen. We worship Him. We adore Him this morning. Remember that this week. Worship Him through the bad times and the good times. He is there always. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to preach between Josh and Mitch. Huh? Good stuff. Appreciate you for being here. If you're visiting with us today, uh, and I know we have some visitors uh, 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 around, if you would, just fill out the green card in front of you uh, that you see in the pew in front of you. Just fill that out and put it in your seat. And we'll pick that up after the uh, service today. We'd like to have a record of you being here, and we appreciate you uh, for coming out. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be asking everybody to fill out a green card again because it's time for us to get our system updated and uh, our, our databases updated. And so we'll be asking everyone in the next couple of weeks uh, to fill out a green card. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of the Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, we've been there for the last three weeks. And uh, we're looking at the churches that Jesus spoke with, the seven churches in the book of the Revelation. You can also get your handouts out of your bulletins and follow along with us uh, and fill in those uh, blanks there and hopefully keep that and maybe use this uh, at some point for a devotion or something like that. Uh, I had somebody bless my heart a couple of weeks ago. They said, Preacher, we, we keep every one of these and put them in a, a notebook. And uh, they said, we've started going back since you've been doing this. We've started going back and reviewing this uh, and, and using it for our daily devotions. And I thought, man, that is a blessing. I said, you are blessing my heart. Um, uh, I encourage you to, to keep these and uh, review these from time to time. Revelation chapter 2, we're starting at verse 18. And uh, let's just read that through the end of the chapter. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write... These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, your, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into a great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on, uh, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And they shall be dashed in pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Today I want to share with you three things about this church. It's always interesting to me as I read uh, these messages, these letters that are sent 
Um, uh, if you'll notice, they're written in red. That tells me that these are the, 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 this is the message of Jesus. These are the words of Jesus to these churches themselves. And, and it's always interesting to me as he points out who it is, the author is of this church uh, or of these letters. And, and, and in this particular situation, he tells them that he is the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like brass. His eyes are like a flame of fire. They are all powerful. They are penetrating. That means they see us uh, uh, from the beginning of our lives to the end and they see us from the inside to the out. These eyes of fire and a feet of brass, which tells me that they, are, that they are precious, they are pure, and they are steadfast. They will not move. They do not change. These, uh, uh, this comes from the Son of God who will not change and who will always be a stalwart in your life if you'll let him. I think that we can look at these, that, that particular verse and these words and it sounds almost like a threat. The one with the, has the eyes like a flame of fire and the feet of brass, that's not a threat. Now, it may be a threat if you're not living for him. It may be a threat if you're doing something you're not supposed to do. But if you're trying to live for the Lord, if you're trying to serve him and live that, that uh, uh, Christian walk and, and, and that Christian life, if you're trying to live for him, that's a blessing that he's able to see, that he cares. Now think about this, that he cares enough about you individually. Do you hear that? That he cares enough about you individually to want to look and see and penetrate your heart. Man, I think that's a blessing if you ask me. Three things that I want to point out to you uh, this morning uh, that we see from this passage of Scripture. First of all, I want you to see four essential qualities. Four essential qualities. In verse 19, he says, I know your works. Now, Jesus has said this to every other church to this point that we have, uh, uh, that he's sent letters to, that we've uh, uh, studied and, and preached on. He says, I know your works. I know what you've done. I know who you are. And he goes on to list these four essential qualities that every church ought to have and what these works are. He says, first of all, write this down, the love that you have. He said, I know your works. And he mentions love there. Guys, if a church does not have love, let me just break it down a little bit further. If a child of God does not have love in their hearts, are you listening to what I'm saying? Love of God in your hearts, then I can tell you for certain that you will at best be ineffective and at worst not even be a child of his to begin with. You must have that love of God found in your heart. You show me a Christian that doesn't have the love of God in his heart, I'll show you a car that doesn't have gas in it. You show me a Christian that doesn't have the love of God in your heart, I'll show you a Krispy Kreme donut with no cream filling. Amen? Now, you understand the, the, the emptiness then uh, uh, without the love of God in your heart. Guys, every Christian ought to have God's love in his heart, or I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. You may not be his to begin with if you don't have that love. Now you say, well, I do have the love of God. I love God, and so I have it in my heart. That's not what the love of God is. God's love is not self-love. God's love is loving someone else. God's love is loving other people. God's love loves the unlovable. He loves you, don't he? And you're unlovable. Now, I'm not. I can't see it in me, but I can see it all over you. Now, sir, listen. God's love loves the unlovable. That's you and me. That's us. And, 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 and if we say that we have the love of God in our hearts, then we have the love for others. We have the love for even those who don't deserve love. Amen. You see, that was me. That was me. I saved when I was nine years old too. I, there's a lot of people that tell me they saved when they were nine years old. I saved when I was nine years old as well. 
And even at nine years old, precious little child as I was, I was not lovable. I was not one who deserved the love of God. But I'm telling you, a Christian is one that has love. He tells this to the church. He says, listen, I know that you have love. I see the love that you have. I know your works, the love that you have in your heart. And guys, he knows ours too. And by the way, because he knows whether or not our church has the love of God, he also knows if we don't. He sees it when we don't have it as well. I want you to look with me at the love chapter in the Bible. You said there's a love chapter in the Bible? Absolutely. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn there with me. Man, if I know there's a love chapter, I'd have been reading it all along. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is known as the love chapter. I want you to see what the Apostle Paul has to say here in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 2. Paul says, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, look at what he says, but have not love, I'm nothing. He says, this, though I have all knowledge, you can have all knowledge of Scripture. You can know the Bible from kever to kever. You can know it all. You can have memorized every one of the Ten Commandments and be able to, 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 to uh, quote the books of the Bible in order. Yeah. You, you can have all, you can understand all the doctrines of the Bible. You can understand the deepest mysteries of the gospel itself. You can have all of the gifts of the Spirit that are offered to you. But I'm telling you, the, Paul said, if you don't have love, it's for nothing. If you don't have love, look at what he says. He says, I am nothing. So that means the love is what makes us something. He says, I'm nothing if I don't have love. And let me tell you, I know a lot of Christians who don't have a whole lot of love. Amen? I mean, I've met a lot of Christians that don't have a whole lot of love. Oh, I'm not judging them. No, they're free to let you know it. They show it in the way they talk and in, the, in their attitude. Some of the sorriest attitude people in the world I've ever met have been Christian. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean honestly, let's just, let's just let's tell on us. Let's tell on ourselves if we could for just a minute. Some of the people with the sorriest attitudes in the world are, are Christians. They are. You, it's hard to have a sorry attitude as a sinner. They're supposed to be that way. Christians aren't. Some of the worst attitudes are Christians, man, that you, you, couldn't, you couldn't please them no matter what. Jesus Christ himself come down and feed them manna from heaven. They wouldn't be pleased with it. He says, if you don't have love, you are nothing. You are nothing. I want you to look at the next one in, in 1 John chapter 3. Look, uh, uh, look at the next verse there. Um, uh, 1 John chapter 3 verse 10. All you got to do is just go back to uh, Revelation. I lost my place. Go back to Revelation chapter 2 and then back up just a couple of pages. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10. Here, John says, this is how you can tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. Look at what he says. He says, in this, the children of God and the children of, devil are, of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Do you see that? He says, you want, to, you want to be able to tell the difference between a child of God and a child of the devil? You want to be able to tell the difference? Here's the difference. One of them doesn't practice righteousness. And one of them doesn't practice, uh, doesn't have the love of God in his heart. Does not love his brother. 
does not have love for other people. One of them is very selfish. One of them is, is very self-centered and does not love other people. And look at what it says. It says they're not children of God if they do not have love for his brother. And by the way, ladies, that goes for you too. Now, don't take it from me and don't throw stones at the, pre at the preacher. I'm just the messenger. I, this, is what, this is the word of God that says, if you don't have the love for your brother, you're not one of his. I'm just giving you the message. Hard to take, man. That's a tough pill to swallow sometimes because we're born selfish people. We're born selfish creatures. I want you to see the second thing he said. He said, I know your works. I know your love. He said, I also know your service. I also know your service. I know what you do for others as well. I know what your actions are that show your love. I know what your actions are that show your love. You see, if you put love uh, into action, you're going to get results every time when you put love into action. You see, when you just, just to, to, to say, yeah, I've got the love in my, of God in my heart, that's good. But when you put it in action, that means something. In the early service, many of you know Bertie Johnson. In the early service, Bertie stood up and she said, I'd like to say before we get started that I, I appreciate Paul Morrison. Y'all know Paul? He, uh, um, uh, he, she said, I'd like to appreciate, uh, let, let Paul Morrison know that I appreciate him and for allowing God to use him. He came out and fixed a leak on my roof. That's love in action. He took time out of his day to go out in the beaten sun. I'm telling you, was y'all out yesterday? It was hot. It was hot. He took time out to go out and to repair her roof that she's had professionals come out and, tr and try to fix it three times and it hadn't worked out. Paul said, I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. And he went out and did it himself. I'm not trying to lift up Paul. I'm trying to lift up the love of God. I'm trying to lift up the service for the brethren. I'm trying to show you that, that it's, not about, it's not about being uh, um, uh, built up ourselves. It's not about puffing ourselves up and saying, boy, look what I did. It's about saying, here is what God can do through you. And that blessed that woman's heart enough it blessed her heart enough to want to stand up and say, I want to thank God for sending Paul. You see, that's being used of the Lord. That's being used of the Lord for service. Look at Galatians, if you would, would you? Um, uh, look at that verse there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Turn there with me. Galatians 5 and verse 13. He says, this is Paul speaking, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only don't use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. He's trying to tell them that they are no longer bound by the law of Moses, but they have been liberated through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he tells them, please be sure not to use that for your own selfish desires, for your own wants, but still be sure to serve the brethren, to serve one another. Please be sure to serve them. Because you see, people out here in the world, they can look at you and they can't see the love in your heart. They can't see it. I mean, man alive, I, I can look at you. I can't see the love in your heart. I can't see the love in your heart. I can see the shirt you have on. But I can't see the love in your heart. The only way I'm able to see it is if I see an example of it. You see, God looks on the heart. Man can only see the outward. And so an example of love is the service that you do. And he tells this church, I know your love and I see your service. I see what you do, how you put it in action. How you don't just say it, but you walk it as well. You don't just talk it. He said, I see that. Look at what he goes on to say. He said, I know your works, your love, your service. And he goes on to say, your faith. Write that down in the third bullet. Your faith there. Guys, faith is important. 
He said, I see your faith. You say, well, why would he say that faith is such a, a stalwart here and, and such an important piece of this, uh, uh, um, uh, an essential quality? Shouldn't they have faith just because they're a church? Well, you would think, but that's not always the case. You see, I've seen churches go some way different than God's. I've seen churches make decisions out of their desires and their wants uh, and not what God wanted. And not saying, let's place this in God's hands. Let's let God have this. Let's see, let's see what God's going to do through this. And let's just follow him. That's faith. You see, he said, I see your works, your love, your service, your faith. And then he goes on to say, and your patience. Oh, hang on just a minute. I'm about, I'm, I'm, I'm about to dispel a doctrine right here that you believe in your heart. I'm about to dispel a doctrine that you hold true to. Somebody lied to you at some point and told you, never pray for patience, didn't they? Y'all ever heard that? Don't pray for patience. Now, I've heard people say, I, preacher, I don't pray for patience now. I will not pray for patience because, because sure enough, as you pray for patience, God puts something on you. He, he, put some, he puts you to a test. And I don't pray for patience because of that. That's wrong. That's wrong. We should pray for patience. We should pray for God's patience. We should, because I'm not a naturally patient person. Now that may shock you. But I am naturally not patient. I, when my dad, I, I got it from him. I got it from him. I remember growing up, he'd say, son, the grass needs cutting. You probably go on outside and cut the grass. And I remember saying these words to him. All right, dad, I'll get it in a minute. Just a minute. A minute, 60 seconds, right? Not to a teenager. Not to a teenager. A minute is when I get to it. See, it's not a, it's not a minute. To, but, but I'd say, yeah, dad, I'll get it in a minute. And my dad would go, I didn't tell you to get it in a minute. I said, you get it right now. And I think, man, why is he so impatient to get the grass cut? Grass ain't going nowhere. What's the big deal, right? Well, I've got a teenage boy now, and I understand why my dad was impatient like that. Because I'm the same way. And I tell my son, I say, son, go take the trash out. And he'll say, all right, I'll get it in a little bit. Mm-mm. No, I didn't say in a little bit. I said right now. Get up and you get the trash together. Why I got to get the trash now? I mean, he's, he's getting up now. He's getting up, but he's, he's, uh, he's mouthing. Why I got to get it now? I don't understand. Why I have to get the trash now? What's so big about the trash? The trash don't even run till Tuesday. Why do I have to get it now? You know, I mean, they're just thinking that it's not about, the, it's not about when the trash runs. I said, get it now. I'm an impatient person when it comes to stuff like that. Honey, you can ask my wife, I need to pray for patience. Now, I also need to make sure that my, when I say get the trash, get the trash and don't ask questions. But I'm not a patient person when it comes to a lot of things, not just my kids. And I need to pray for patience because here's what I know. The Lord is not the one that tests your patience when you start praying for it. The devil is who tests your patience when you start praying for it. And let me say this, he's going to test you anyway. He's going to test you anyway, whether you're praying or not. You're still going to be tested. You think Satan is saying, boy, I can't wait till they start praying for patience <laughs> so I can start tempting them. <laughs> no, that's not what he does. He tempts you anyway. He ain't waiting on you to pray for patience. You go ahead and pray. You need it. There are four essentials. That's why I call this the model church. Because up to this point, they are the model church. The Lord says you've got the four essential qualities that every church ought to have. You've got the four essential qualities. And here's the beautiful thing about these qualities. Every one of them build on each other. Every one of them build on each other. You start with the foundation of love, and through the love of God, the service comes out. 
It's just a natural outflow of love. It's the service to others. And then, and then after, once uh, that service is shown to, the, to the, a lost and dying world, they see your faith because of the service. And they realize, hey, that guy's a Christ follower. That guy's a Christian. They see your faith. And through building up your faith and exercising your faith muscle and building that thing up, then you start to build up patience. Because you, with, with great faith comes great patience in waiting on God and saying, Lord, it's all in your time. It's not in mine. They all build on each other. But you start with love. And look at what else he says. And I'm going to hit this and go on. I'm not going to talk about it a long time. But look at what he says there um, uh, in, in verse 19. He says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works... The last are more than the first. He says, you're getting better at it. You're getting better. You're better at it than you were when you first started. You're growing. That's good. I call this the model church because of all this. And unfortunately, the chapter doesn't end there. Jesus goes on to correct them in some areas that need to be corrected or all that love, service, faith, and patience is going to go for naught. I want you to see wep uh, Satan's weapon of choice. Look at Satan's weapon of choice. Verse 20 he says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things offered to idols. That is Satan's weapon of choice. You say, a woman? Yep, that's it. No, that's not it. That's not his weapon of choice. His weapon of choice is what they were allowing her to do. He said, you are allowing her, this woman called Jezebel, this prophetess, to teach. So the first fill in there is false teachings, is one of his weapons of choice. Now, there was indeed a woman, no doubt, coming in and, and, and uh, infiltrating the church and harming and hurting the church. No doubt there was a woman doing this. But her name probably wasn't Jezebel. The Lord was, was comparing her to the Jezebel of the Old Testament. Because I don't know anybody that would want to name their daughter Jezebel. You don't see any little girls running around here named Jezebel anymore, do you? Huh? No. Angelina Jolie, she makes a big movie and that does real good and she's a pretty woman and all that kind of stuff. Everybody wants to name their, their girl Angelina. Um, uh, um, uh, every, you know, nobody wants to name their son Hitler. You don't see any little Hitlers come, go, walking around, do you? you? You just know that you are marking that child for a beating when he gets into school. When you start naming him things like that. Nobody names their daughter Jezebel. All right? Because if her self-esteem isn't low enough when she he hits the teenage years, it will hit rock bottom if her name's Jezebel as a teenager. I'm just telling you. But he says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you've allowed that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and what is she teaching? She's teaching uh, um, sexual immorality. She's teaching uh, uh, spiritual immorality as well. That's what she's teaching. So it's these false teachings that she is wooing the people with. Now here's the thing, guys. Some of you have been a Christian for a long time. I was tempted to, to, to make everybody stand up and say, you know, who's been a Christian for, you know, 15 years? Stand up. Who's been a Christian for 20 years? Stand up. And that kind of thing. I'm not going to do that. But some of you have been a Christian for a long time. Some of you have been a Christian longer than I've been alive. 20-some years. Some of y'all have been Christians for a long time. You know what? You need to be strong enough as a Christian to not be easily swayed by false teaching. You need to be strong enough in the Word of God to not be easily swayed by, by wrong teaching, by false teaching. But you see, there are a lot of people that have been saved for a very long time that wouldn't know, uh, thus saith the Lord, from thus saith Colonel Sanders. 
They wouldn't know the difference. Years ago, I was pastoring a church, and this little old lady would come to church. She was a sweet lady. She really was. She was a, a, a good woman, um, a, a, widowed, a, a widow woman, and she had been saved for a long, long time. A long time. She's one of these grandmother types that, you know, you just love. She come to church one day, and uh, she was walking out after the service, and she said, Preacher, you know what? I was so blessed this weekend. She said, Yesterday, I had these two fine young men come to my door and talk to me about the Lord. I said, Really? She said, yeah. I said, well, what were they doing? She said, well, they were inviting people to their church. And she said, they were just the most precious young men that came and, and talked to me. And I said, what did they talk to you about? She said, scripture. She said, man, they quoted the Bible. She said, I was so impressed with how much Bible they knew. I said, wow, what church are they from? She said, I can't remember. She said, but they gave me a Bible. I said, did they? She said, yeah, they gave me a Bible even. I said, I'd love to see that Bible. She said, well, I'll bring it tonight. I said, wonderful. Bring it with you. To and so she brought it with her that night, and she handed it to me, and it was the Book of Mormon. She'd been saved for years and did not know the difference. Didn't, did, couldn't see the difference. She said, yeah, it's a New Testament. I said, no, it's another testament is what they told you. It's not a New Testament. It's another testament. Now, I didn't say it to her like that. But I said, no, honey, they've... I said, let me show you something. And I grabbed my Bible and I, I opened it up to Matthew 1.1. And I said, now, take this and find, find Matthew 1.1. Let's read it together. Not in there. She said, well, I don't recognize these names. I said, you're right. You see, she'd been saved for a long time. You think that maybe we ought to be strong enough to be able to tell false teaching and false doctrine when we hear it? Don't you think we should? I love Mormons. I don't want any of them to go to hell. I want them to all get saved. I want them to all come to know Jesus as Savior, not as teacher. As Savior. I do. But we need to be strong enough to be able to tell the difference between what's right and what's, not, and what's unbiblical. That's one of Satan's most powerful weapons. Most powerful weapons. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. Those guys that come to her door knew more scripture than she did. And she'd been saved longer than both those guys put together. And they knew more Scripture than she did. Hey, how much Scripture you know? Uh, let me ask you something. If, if, one of them, if one of them fine young men come to your door, would you be able to, to quote more Scripture than they did today? You see, we need to be able to pick out the false teaching. Let me give you the second tool, the second weapon. Lust. Lust is the second weapon of choice. Look at what it says there in verse 20. It said, you've allowed this teacher, this, this, this woman, the Jezebel, to come in and to teach and seduce. Lust is the second weapon of Satan. And he's been using it from the beginning of time. Y'all remember there was a woman one time who was in this beautiful garden. Her husband wasn't exactly right there with her. Not that it would have made a difference. He's weak as water too. But uh, Satan came to this woman in the form of a snake. And he said, hey, are, are you the... I'm paraphrasing. I'm giving you the DIV version. He said, uh, that's the Derek International version, okay? He said, hey, are, 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 do y'all run this place here? Do y'all run this garden? She said, yeah, the Lord has given us rule over everything in the garden. The snake said, uh-uh. No, he hasn't. He's not giving you the rule over everything. You're not, you don't have control over everything. That tree you're standing beside, you don't have control over he told you not to touch it, remember? 
She said, oh, yeah, but we've got rule over everything else. He said, yeah, but not everything. Because God don't want you to know everything he knows. And that's why he told you not to eat of this tree, remember? And she got to thinking about that thing. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder why. I wonder why he don't want us to eat of the fruit of this tree. I wonder why. And Satan said, hmm, I wonder why. Why don't you see what he's got? Why don't you? Guys, it was lust. You see, lust isn't always sexually immoral. You can be spiritually immoral and lust. What does the Bible say? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You could, you could translate that lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the lust of the world. The lust of materialism. The lust of life. It's lust that Satan used on Eve. The lust for her knowledge. The lust for power. I, it, it amazes me. These uh, political races these days. We're right in the midst of one. We've got a, a presidential election coming up, and, and you see all the, the, the signs, the political signs and stuff like that. It makes me wonder, why would anybody in the world want to be on the board of mayor and alderman here in Churchill? Why would you do that? You're putting a target on your back. And if you're running for it, God bless you. I'm going to pray for you because you're going to need it. Why would anybody want to be a mayor of a little town like this? I mean, where everybody knows your address. <laughs> everybody knows your address. I can't tell you where the mayor of Nashville, Tennessee lives. I can't tell you where he lives. I've never known where, and I grew up in Nashville. All the mayors we've had, I couldn't have told you where the house was. I can take you right directly to the living room of the mayor of this town. Why would you want to do that? A lot of these people that are running for office, they're not running for office. Now, I'm not talking about a small town like this right here. I'm talking about the big government. And I, a lot of them, they're not running for office because they just want to serve people. It's because of a lust of power. A lust of power. There is a lust that Satan uses on you and me. And he knows which lust to use on you. It may not be a sexually uh, uh, driven thing. It could be something else. But nonetheless, it's lust. So that's Satan's weapon of choice, false teaching and lust. Now, let me stop right here and tell you. In this day, when, when he's talking to the churches, understand this. Now, try to picture this in your mind. It, it blows my mind. It really does. But I don't understand it all. But try to picture it in your mind. These people, now think about this. These people in the Middle East... It was normal for sexual immorality to happen. It was normal for that to happen. It was normal. They, it was so normal that they made it a part of worship in the pagan temples. It was a part of worship, sexual immorality was. You were expected to be sexually immoral. You were expected to be if you were going to be a good follower of whatever deity they, they chose that you happened to choose to follow that day. It was expected. It wasn't hid in the closet. It wasn't behind closed doors. It wasn't kept hush-hush and secret. You, you didn't care if everybody knew about it because everybody was doing it. Isn't that the most ungodly thing you've ever heard of? They thought it was okay. And it was so prevalent that it was even starting to sneak into the church. And people were okay with it. I'm talking about into God's church. And people were okay with it. Let me just tell you this. We're not okay with it here today. Okay? If you're stepping out on your husband or wife, you better repent. It's not okay. It's always wrong, and it always will be. They accepted the practice then. Why lust, whatever. They didn't care because it was a part of worship in that day. And here the Lord is saying, she's using it to pull you and drag you away from me. That's Satan's weapon of choice. False teachings and lust. He's used it in every church so far that we've, that we've preached on. 
And he'll continue to use it in, in the church today. Let me give you the final thing. I call this tying a knot at the end of a rope. Tying a knot at the end of the rope. Look at what he says in verse 25. But hold fast to what you have till I come. Hold fast to what you have till I come. Holding fast means tie a knot at the end of your rope. When you feel like that you're about to go overboard, tie a knot at the end of a rope. When you feel like you're about to fall and you're about to lose it, tie a knot at the end of the rope. And hang on. Hang on. Don't give up. Don't lose hope. Don't let go. Hang on, Jesus says, till I come. I got to be honest with you. I'm looking forward to Jesus coming. Amen? If he came before the end of this service today, be fine with me. Be fine with me. Let's go. If you left here, cut the lights off as you leave. Because I am out of here. I'm telling you. I cannot wait for that to happen. Jesus is coming again. And you might stand here and think, well, he, is, he won't come today now. Surely he won't come today. Keep saying that. Because the Bible tells me the more you say it, the more likely it's going to happen. We'll start, we'll, nobody will think it's time for him to come. And boom, gone. Trumpet sounds, I'm out. Heard a preacher say one time, he said, I'm so excited about it, every time I hear a trumpet, I start jumping. <laughs> the truth is, guys, one day he's coming back for us. And until he does, we need to hang on. That first fill in is until I come. Write that in there. Until I come. That's what he tells them. Tie a knot at the end of the rope and hang on until I come. He might come before we leave this earth in death. He might not. But he might. He might come before we leave this building today. He might not. But it wouldn't shock me if he did. We just need to tie a knot at the end of the rope. And hang on till he does. Now listen to me and I'm closing. Listen to me. I know for a fact there's some of you. You're at the end of your rope. Isn't that right? You're at the end of your rope. I know for a fact that there's some of you that you heard of people that are one paycheck away from bankruptcy? <clears throat> I know for a fact there are people that are one event away, one bad event away from letting go. From letting go. And I'm not naive enough to think that there's not some in here that way today. You came into the doors of this church this morning and you came in with a smile on your face and you shook hands and you were singing the praises to God, but really seriously deep down in your heart, You feel like you're about to let go. I understand that. The Lord says this to this church. He said, listen, I know it looks bad all around you. I know the things are against you. I know that there's even somebody in the church that's trying to tear it up. But for those of you that haven't succumbed to that false doctrine, for the, to those of you that haven't given in to the lust that she's espousing, he says, tie a knot in the end of the rope and hang on till I come. Don't give up. Don't let go. Give it to God first. And here's the promise, he says. You can write this down. He says, and one day you will rule the nations. That's what that last feeling is. You will rule the nations. You'll be on top of the world one day. But for right now, tie a knot and hang on. Tie a knot and hang on. Let's close our Bibles up today. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen. You may have said, Preacher, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. 
I'm at the end of my rope. I just don't know if I can hang on much longer. You're exactly right. And preacher, I don't know what to do. I can't talk to anybody. I can't tell anybody about it. And I just don't think any, I'd, be, I'd be embarrassed to try to share it with someone. Let me tell you this. The devil is telling you that it's embarrassing. You can't stand in front of me and tell me something that's going to shock me. You can't stand in front of me and tell me something that I'd step back and go, Whew, I've never heard that before. If you're at the end of your rope and you don't know if you're going to make it, you do have somebody that cares. You do have somebody that will listen. You do have somebody that loves you. You've got Jesus. And you've got your preacher. And I think between the three of us, we can probably work this thing out, whatever it may be. I think we can work it out. I've seen some pretty desperate situations that God did some amazing things in. I think between the three of us, we could work it out. But I'll tell you one more. You've got a church family that loves you and that will pray for you and that cares about you. You've just got to be willing to let them. You've just got to be willing to let them. Let's stand to our feet with heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around.